everybody. This afternoon's session is the Darcy um, Lecture Series. I am the uh, Richard Layton. I'm president of the foundation, which is the sponsor for this, this lecture series. Um, and with that, we have uh, three special guests um, that we're going to introduce and give them a few seconds here to speak ahead of time. For the first time, the Darcy Lecture Series has had some sponsors. Uh, Montgomery and Associates, CDM Smith, Woodward and Curran, Liggett, Brashears, and Graham. Uh, stepped up and helped us fund this, the uh, lecture series so we can give them more talks. And as you're going to hear, he talked all over the world and a lot more than uh, many other people have done. So with that, I would like to introduce Seth Kellogg from CDM Smith to speak for a few seconds, minutes here. It's 37 seconds exactly, right? Yep, absolutely. I okay. know Bob. So yeah. <laughs> um, CDM Smith is very pleased to have the opportunity to support NGW REF, as well as the Darcy Lecture. We had the pleasure to host the lecture in our Boston headquarters office this year. The event was very well received, and it was a great opportunity to bring together scientists and engineers from academia, state and federal government, as well as the private sector. CDM Smith looks forward to continuing our support for NJW REF and the Darcy Lecture. Thank you. Our next uh, special uh, person is Jason House from Woodward and Kern. I didn't realize I was a special person. But, yeah. Um, well, special in many I'm ways. A special boy. <laughs> <laughs> Trip is like a um, Water is our most important resource, and Woodward and Kern is very happy to be able to uh, to sponsor a talk that really is all about groundwater, which is the most uh, readily available source of uh, fresh water on the planet, the largest source of fresh water on the planet. Um, the Darcy Lecture is such an important uh, knowledge transfer tool and technology transfer tool, and it's touched tens of thousands of people over the course of its, um, uh, over the course of its history, and uh, inspiring many young students to, to consider a career in our, uh, our industry. And so, Woodard and Kern is very pleased to provide funding for the foundation and for, for the Darcy Lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, John Jensen from LBG. That's easier to say, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, and not to uh, repeat everything that's just been said, uh, LBG is very proud to be sponsoring. We, we think of it as an honor to be associated with it. Um, it's this is my third time I've heard the talk. Every time so far, I've, I've gotten more out of it. It's been very useful. I think you'll enjoy it. And I guess I would just like to encourage you all to think about stepping up and supporting your association and the foundation. Um, it's not that much money, and it does an awful lot of good for people around the world. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ty. Our, our speaker, our Darcy speaker, is Ty Foray. He's a professor with the Department of Hydro Hydrology and Water Resources at the University of Arizona. He received his bachelor's degree in geophysical engineering from the Colorado School of Mines and his PhD in earth sciences from the University of Waterloo. It, and All before right. you start, Todd, yeah. oh, fantastic. we have a small token. Uh, we have the public fountains of the city of Dijon, oh, uh, Darcy's yeah. great work, Great. and a, a plaque to recognize your service, show our appreciation, and hopefully remember this year that you didn't get to sleep. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks for that. And thanks uh, very much for the sponsorship of the, of the year. It's been an amazing year, a fantastic opportunity to get out to our whole community, almost our whole community, and, uh, and have a chance to talk with people, ask them questions, learn a lot from other folks. Um, before we sort of launch into the talk, uh, I, I love the opportunity to embarrass people, so I'm going to embarrass somebody here maybe and thank Rachel Geddes for incredible support all through the year. So if you haven't worked with her, so. All right, let's get started. So the Darcy Lecture, you've heard a little bit about it, and I'm not going to leave this up here probably long enough for you to read it. Suffice it to say, it's a great honor to be able to give the talk. And it's, uh, I think, unique in the academic type talks that we have uh, probably across the sciences, I think. And it's unique, I think, in many ways. And one of those is uh, 
that it really is meant to be this, this merger between uh, academic and practice. And that's really my goal for this talk, that has been my goal for the talk, is really to try to take one topic that I thought was generally important and give a talk that is accessible for almost any audience. So I hope that uh, that rings true today as well. It is in the form of a lecture, much more than a, a standard scientific talk. So I'm not going to try to take 10 academic papers and jam them together and force them uh, down your throat in an hour, because that's impossible to listen to. Um, so I'm going to uh, repeat some things that many of you will know. Uh, but the goal is to have a, a standard set of, of concepts by the time that we get to the end of the talk uh, so that you can ask me questions or challenge me on some of the things that I, that I put forward in the talk. Um, the talk has taken me far and wide. Um, so this will be the last talk of a series of 123. Uh, it's taken me to every continent except for Antarctica, and I think last count was 26 countries. Um, so it's been, as I say, a, a fantastic year for me and a very challenging year for my family. Um, what you'll see on the, on the slide on the bottom, and I'll bring it up at the very end and I'll leave it there, it's a QR code, and that has a lot of the detailed information that I won't go through in the talk today. Today I'm going to keep things fairly general, almost philosophical. Um, on that slide there's also just pictures of what is it really like to travel around the world and give the same talk 123 times. <laughs> And uh, then I also tried to capture all of the questions that people have asked me at the end of all of these talks. So if you're interested in what people are thinking about the topic I'll present, uh, you can see, uh, again, comments and questions from around the world on, that, on this topic. Now, as I say in the middle here, I'm really trying to come up with a talk that falls right in the midst of the research world, the applied world, and even just uh, a group of citizens, people who have interest in their water supply, but maybe don't have expertise, but want to know something more about how the science of hydrogeology is done and how it might impact them. So to do that, I've tried to bring in a couple of elements that also aren't in most scientific talks. And I'll start with the more embarrassing of the two, and that is my attempt at poetry. So this is the most succinct way that I can describe what I think it means to be a hydrogeologist. <laughs> Basically, it's this. We never have enough data. We're never going to have enough data. We just have to live with that fact that we're not going to, even with geophysics, we're not going to have all the data that we want. And yet, more and more people are asking us to help them to make decisions today about actions they might take related to their water supply that will have impacts for decades, maybe even centuries. And the only way we can do that is to build predictive models. That's the only tool we have for looking out into the future that way. So at the very core of who we are, we have a real problem, and that is we need to make predictive models, and we will never have enough data to really calibrate those models exactly. And so the best that we can do is expect that at the end of all of the work that we do, there will still be a great deal of uncertainty. So how do we do our work in a way that it helps people to answer water-related questions under uncertainty, not to get to the final answer, but to improve that process of decision-making? So to talk about that, I'll bring forward some ideas about data, many ideas about models and the way we do modeling, and all of this hopefully in a decision support context. The other element that I bring forward and I really rely on um, is the, the concept of storytelling and the power of storytelling. Uh, in part, I do this because I know I'm going to be talking to a broad audience, or I was talking to a broad audience. And this idea of storytelling cuts across all cultures. We've all developed a way to bring disparate facts together, put them into a context that makes sense to us, that becomes our internal narrative, and that internal narrative essentially becomes our reality. That's what we think the, the way the world works, is how we view this internal story. Now, this is a simple way to look at the, the concept of storytelling. Uh, it comes out of literary analysis, and they have a much more complicated view of this same thing. But, if you think about it a bit, it makes sense in this way. If you imagine opening a book, a book of fiction, you start reading it, you've gotten to the point where you know who all the characters are and where it's taking place. At that point, that story could go any of a thousand different ways. And some of those endings will make you very unhappy, some of them will make you very happy. And along the way, those narratives that end up in very different places will stay very close to each other for a very long time. And these are important points. The point where someone's narrative that thinks that an action that might be taken in their basin is really going to end up in a bad place, and someone else who thinks it's not going to have an impact 
there are many points of agreement. And if we can find those points of agreement and then explore the, the differences in their understanding of the systems, we have a better chance of helping people to make more scientifically based decisions. So that's the, the, how I'm using this idea of storytelling uh, throughout. Now, as scientists, if we want to go back to these points of departure, there are really two extreme ways that we can think about doing it. One that I'll call blasting is one that we often fall into as scientists. And that is we, we come into a situation where a group of citizens is trying to make a decision, and we don't think they're doing it in a very scientific way, and we think, if only you were more scientific about your thinking, you would make better decisions. And of course, they don't like to hear that, and in many cases, that's not true. But we tend to come in and try to blast forward with this idea that the science has the answers. Another way or the other extreme is brought up by uh, folks in psychology, uh, Thaler and others, at least to the concept of nudging. And this idea of nudging essentially says that if you can go back to the point where somebody understands or believes something, and then you can move with them from that point, you can actually help them to move in a different direction. And our goal is to help them to move into a more scientific basis for making their decisions, rather than saying they should just abandon anything that they think is valuable. Now, another aspect of storytelling is that a good story, of course, should have an arc, a beginning, a middle, an end, and it should leave you with something that's easier to remember than just a recitation of the facts. So I'm going to try to do that in telling you about this guy, Henry Darcy. Now, many of you have heard stories about Darcy before, some haven't, but I want you to leave with at least a flavor of who the person was who is credited with being the father of our field. So Henry Darcy was born in the early 1800s in Dijon, France. When he was very young, his father died, which at that point was a tragedy because it meant that he had no prospect of an education. He had no money to be educated. So his mother went to the town council and asked if they would pay for his education. They agreed to do so. And then later in life, when he had become established as a respected engineer in Paris, they asked him to come back and help to deal with an existential problem that Dijon had faced for 300 years. And that is that their water supply was so bad that people would regularly die from drinking the water. Now that's a problem. The worst problem is that everybody knew that. So they would avoid Dijon as they traveled through Europe. So the town was literally starving due to its poor water supply. So Darcy comes in and he looks for solutions as an engineer. He sees two possible solutions. One, you can go to some distance to some springs emanating from hills. And you can take that clean water, you build a canal system, and bring it to the city of Dijon. The second, the one that we don't often talk about as much, is that there were wells right at the edge of town. And these wells flowed clean water. So he had the choice. Should he use the wells or the springs? So he thought, well, I don't really understand how these wells work, how that water moves through the subsurface. So let me apply the latest science. And the latest science had to do with energy losses as water flows through a pipe. So if you take this equation and you apply it to something like drinking water from a glass through a straw, you'll find that all of the energy loss that's calculated occurs right within the straw. It perfectly calculates, perfectly predicts that. If you do the same for drawing water out of a well, you find that much or even most of the energy loss takes place outside of the well, in the porous medium. So this was enough to understand that there was something happening in the subsurface that made it not like a glass of water, made it perhaps less reliable. So the choice was to go with the springs. He oversaw the building of the canal system, brought the water to the city of Dijon. And for that, for solving this problem that had faced them for so long, uh, they awarded him a prize, the equivalent of $1 million, which he then turned down, saying that the town had educated him as a young person. And this is simply what he owed them for doing that. So that's our Darcy. Now, that's one aspect of what Darcy did. It's actually not what he's most well known for in some ways. What is best known for is work that he did later, which was looking at porous media, different types of porous media as filters, and realizing that different media allowed water to move more or less easily through them. So this, through his column experiments, he led to the idea and led to Darcy's law and the hydraulic conductivity. So if we take these two aspects of what Darcy did, looking at withdrawing water and having that have some impact to a distance because of this energy loss in the subsurface, and also the recognition that different parts of the subsurface would allow water to move more and less easily, it really bounds what we still do as hydrogeologists today in an interesting way. I'm going to try to build on these ideas and take two more modern examples and use those to illustrate the talk. The first is this one. Uh, it was done by Andy Leaf and Mike Feenan at the USGS in Wisconsin. Uh, 
And here, if you can see it, there's a yellow line right there that represents a proposed mine. The ore actually resides beneath the water table. So to extract the ore, you have to draw down the water table, dewater the ore. But that dewatering, as Darcy would have surmised, will have some impact to a distance. And that means that the surrounding communities, including this community that's surrounded by a red line, which is a Native American community that subsists in part by harvesting wild rice, they potentially could be impacted by this withdrawal of water for the mine. So this is a typical water resource, shared resource problem that we deal with as hydrogeologists. The second is a transport problem, a contaminant transport problem. This was done by Tim Bailey, who at the time was a PhD student with me. Uh, in this case, we have these two pink areas, which are contaminated groundwater. Each one in the bottom right corner has a known source of contamination. In general, water flows from your right to your left, but we can see that the plumes are not moving in the ground, uh, regional groundwater flow direction. And that's because of a couple of important geologic features. There's a fault along the left here, which is impermeable, and then there's an anticline. And this anticline is separating these two sources and causing them to flow in this parallel path. But we have a real unknown about this anticline. And that is we really don't know if it plunges in the northwest, which might allow those plumes to change direction as they move farther along. As with many of our systems, there are other uncertainties that we face. One, which is typical, is we don't know the recharge value. So we don't know, this is western United States, we don't know how much of the rainfall actually makes it to the groundwater as recharge. And it's also fairly typical, we have good coverage within this property, this yellow area surrounds uh, an, an owned property, and we have very poor coverage outside. So we have some limitations in knowing what the surrounding area, how it's influencing our uh, domain. Uh, the crux of the problem here is that if either one of these plumes crosses this yellow line in any place, in the next 200 years, they'll face tens of millions of dollars of cleanup costs. So the owners of this property are very interested in knowing when and if those plumes will cross the boundary, at what concentrations, and how long will they persist. So that's the second illustrative uh, example that I'll give. Now, these examples uh, are fairly different from each other from a hydrogeologic perspective, but we tend to deal with them in the same way. And I would describe that this way. We deal with them as scientists, reductively. Our thought is, I want to know as much as I can about a given system so that I feel comfortable making decisions about how to simplify the problem. Once I've simplified the problem conceptually, I'll build a model, and I'll use that model to make predictions that people can use to make decisions. That's our usual workflow. And it works very well for us from a scientific point of view. But I'm going to guess that if you are the person who needs an answer, it can be very frustrating if I tell you, I can't tell you anything about the system until I know everything about the system. So ideally, we'd like to find a way to turn this around. Start from the decisions. Can we understand exactly which uncertainties we need to understand about the system, build the models to address those uncertainties, and then look for the data that best constrains those models? So the talk will be about how we turn this around and do things in the opposite direction. Now, if I'm going to start at the bottom of this and start talking about decisions, this is an area of the talk that really is a lecture part that many of you will know this already. And I'm going to start very simply. In fact, I'm not even going to give you a definition of decisions because you all already know what a decision is. You've made a thousand decisions already today. You're very comfortable with decision making. And in part, that's the real problem that we face. We're so comfortable with decision making that we often don't think about how we make decisions. And maybe more importantly, we don't think about how other people make decisions and therefore how we can best influence or inform their decisions. So I'm going to start right at the beginning, a very, very simple version of what a decision might look like. And again, you've seen this before. It's a trade-off between a projected cost, what we think the cost of affecting an action might be, and the projected benefit. How much do we think we'll gain by taking this action? Now, even in this simple sense where we're just saying if the benefit outweighs the cost, we should take that action. We know that uncertainty is really what makes this difficult. And there are two types of uncertainty that I want to illustrate. The first has to do with the fact that both the costs and the benefits are in the future. So we don't really know them that well. And so if we have some uncertainty about either the cost or the benefit or both, something that looks like a good decision might in fact be a bad decision. We're used to this kind of decision making, or uncertainty for decision making. But there's another kind of uncertainty that's actually more difficult to deal with. So I want you to imagine that we know the costs and benefits perfectly, but if there's something more fundamental about the way the process works or the way the decision is going to be activated, 
then we can really fall into uncertainties. And these we'll call structural uncertainties. That would be if we don't know the location of the fulcrum. We don't know which way the balance is going to go, even if we know the costs and benefits perfectly. So just to illustrate that idea of two types of uncertainties. Now, this is very, very general. It goes beyond science, of course. It's a very general way of thinking about making decisions under uncertainty. And it's so general, in fact, that it's been very well covered. Uh, I'll give two books that I think do a good job of each type. The first is with uh, David Eagleman. He's a neuroscientist. He looks at the human brain as it makes decisions, so on an individual level. And one of the fascinating things that he's put forward is this idea that our brains have actually evolved, evolved structures and evolved processes to deal with detailed uncertainty. We are accustomed to dealing with detailed uncertainty. The reason being that our senses are imperfect sensors of the world. So we know that everything we see is not really what's out there. It's some impression of that. So we have to make decisions with imperfect data. Eagleman also has an interesting idea that one of the ways that we do this is our brains continually make multiple interpretations of what we see and hear. And they're always competing against each other. And we're trying to find that one idea that kind of bubbles to the surface. And that will come up later in the talk. Now, in contrast to this, this structural uncertainty, this more fundamental uncertainty, this is the kind of thing that Daniel Kahneman deals with. He recently won the Nobel Prize for helping to establish behavioral economics which in a sense is the field of how do people make decisions? And especially, how do they make decisions when they have some fundamental uncertainties? And Kahneman's premise, as is shown in his title, is that when we feel like we do not have a lot of fundamental uncertainties, we are comfortable making very slow, logical, scientifically based decisions, if you want to think of it that way. When we feel like we have more and more structural uncertainty, we rely more on bias, on shortcuts, on easy metrics to make decisions. These are the fast decisions that we make. So these are the two types of uncertainty that I want to bring forward. If you haven't read these books, and if my one minute of explanation hasn't really gotten you there, I'm going to try to push it a little bit farther by asking you to play a game with me. So here's the game. I want you to imagine that I've given each one of you a pair of dice. You get to roll them exactly one time. It's perfect here in Vegas to finish this talk. If you roll a seven, any combination, I'll give you $100, right? So it sounds like we're next door. Of course, just like next door, you have to pay to play. And that's the question that I have for you. How much would you actually put on the table to play one roll of the dice with a chance of winning $100? And it actually works better if you have a number in mind. So think about how much you would be comfortable putting on the table for that roll on one roll of the dice. And now that you're imagining yourself there, I'd like you to picture that you have your money on the table and you're just about ready to start the game. And I pull out of my pocket this pair of dice. And I say, oh, did I mention these are the dice we're going to be playing with? Would you like to change your bet? Would that change the way you feel about that bet? Now, here's, I'm going to try to unpack both parts of this, the regular dice and then the unusual dice. The regular dice, it turns out, the answer to what you should be willing to pay was worked out way back in the 1650s by Blaise Pascal. The math is very simple. It says you have a one in six chance of winning. You would win $100, so you should be willing to bet up to $16.67. So just out of curiosity, knowing that I have a lot of people potentially from Vegas here, would you raise your hand if you had that number or higher in mind as to what you would be willing to bet? So now, it is remarkable because this is the, by far the highest percentage that I've had in any audience. <laughs> and yet it's still down, it's still down around 10 or 15% if I had to guess. So why is that? It's not that the math is difficult. There's something else going on. What's really pushing us to make a lower bet than the logic would tell us? Well, there are a couple of aspects of this. And one was very nicely described by an American baseball manager with a colorful name of Sparky Anderson. Sparky Anderson had many great sayings. One was, it hurts twice as bad to lose as it feels good to win. And this is a nice expression of the idea of loss aversion. Imagine yourself sitting there losing at the table five times, $16.67 at a time, and then winning 100 bucks. You're still going to feel bad there, right? So this avoidance of loss, this avoidance of risk, crops up in many of our decision-making processes. So then what happens with the additional uncertainty of adding that unusual pair of dice? Well, now, of course, we don't even know what the chances of rolling a seven are. But did any of you think that maybe these dice would roll a seven every single time? Did you have any reason not to think that? We go immediately to thinking, if there's a chance of a bad outcome, it's probably going to happen to me. So we overestimate the likelihood of a bad outcome, 
and the cost of a bad outcome. And these things come together to lead to the loss aversion that, again, uh, infects or, or at least influences many of our decisions. So what do we do as a scientist? Say that we come in and we want to help people to make a more logical bet here. Well, essentially what we're saying is you have this narrative that at some point is dividing off and making you think that bad outcomes are more likely and more costly. What can I do as a scientist to help you to understand your real risks, to describe your real risks in a way that you can really process them? How can I nudge you along the way? And in particular, how can I allay your fears about using this pair of dice? Well, the easy answer would be, I want to watch this pair of dice roll a thousand times. I want to know the, the statistics and update them, and I can tell you what you should bet. But that's equivalent to saying, I want to wait for 200 years and see if the plume crossed the boundary, and then tell you if you should have been ready to build a treatment plant. We don't get that option, right? We have limited data, and we have to make projections based on it. So let's imagine here that you're trying to advise people on this pair of dice, and you're not allowed to roll them, watch them roll at all. What can you do, right? Well, what we do is what we always do, is we build a representation of the system, a model of the system. And the idea in building that model is I want to capture what I think are the most important elements and ignore everything else. So in this case, I might make the case that the most important thing about these dice that we don't know is where's the center of mass in each one. We don't know if they're uniform density like a good pair of dice. And everything else, I think, is secondary. So then I would build a model of dice that looks like this. They're perfect cubes, but I don't know where the center of mass is. So now I have one model of the dice, but I have many, many possible pairs of dice that I might experience with that model. And in fact, I can describe every single pair of those dice. And I can do that and place them on this surface, where every one of these blocks represents a different pair of centers of mass of the dice. And the model itself is that entire space. And we'll call this our parameter space. We have one model and a space of multiple possible realizations. Now, can we do anything with this, though, to help you to make a better decision? Well, in fact, we can. And this is how we go about doing it. We say, let's imagine to start with that that's the pair of dice that we're going to face. If that's the pair of dice, I know the centers of mass. I can use my model to predict how often it would roll a 7. I can use Pascal's equation to tell you what you should be willing to pay. And I can do that for every possible pair of dice. All that I don't know, because I don't have any data, is which pair of dice is actually the one you're going to face. So I have to treat them as all equally likely. So I can take all of these results of how much you should be willing to pay, and I can look at the distribution across all these possible pairs of dice, and this is what we see. We see with that unusual pair of dice that even though there's a lot of uncertainty, most of it doesn't matter. Most of those pairs of dice will still roll a seven one time and six. And you can convince yourself of this by imagining taking one pair of regular dice and fixing it at a one, and then rolling the other dice. You still have a one in six chance of rolling a seven. So a lot of that uncertainty doesn't matter. And I'm gonna make the claim that that is exactly what we face. We deal with very complex systems, and most of that uncertainty doesn't matter for the question we've been asked. The trick is to find out what uncertainty does matter and to try to narrow that down. So we can actually go a step farther here. If you were Blaise Pascal, the few of you who are Blaise Pascal in the audience, you should look at this distribution, and if you were willing to pay 1667 on the dice, it's essentially equivalent to saying the center of mass, the most likely outcome, the maximum, likely out maximum likelihood outcome, however you want to describe it, that peak is so strong that I'm actually willing to pay 1667 with those unusual dice without even seeing them roll, because the chances are so good that they will still roll a seven one time in six. Now, for the rest of us who aren't willing to base 1667, we have the same distribution. We just happen to see it a different way. When we see that distribution, we see these low probability, high risk outcomes. And that's what influences our decision. That's why we'll pay less than 1667, and we want to reduce our bet when we see these unusual dice. All right, we've moved a long way away from hydrogeology, but let's try to bring this, start to bring this back. The point now is how do we go about changing people's minds, and importantly, helping them to understand the risks that they actually face. So the way we do that, or the way we suggest to do that, is to start out by understanding what it is that they're concerned about, and then figure out, can we identify whether or not that's even probable or likely? So in this case, we'd say, you are worried about dice coming up with seven very infrequently, and in fact, when we look across these different centers of mass, 
there are some pairs of dice that will be very much to your disadvantage. So the question is, is the pair of dice that you're de dealing with one of these bad pairs of dice or one of the good pairs of dice? And that's where data come in. That's why we measure, is to determine whether or not the actual pair of dice you're facing are far away from one of these problem situations or whether they suggest that a problem situation is quite likely. That's why we're measuring. Now, that's easy to say. What's difficult to say, and so we usually don't spend a lot of time thinking about it, is what should we measure? How do we make the measurement that best tells us whether the risk that's in our mind is the actual risk that we face? And I'm going to start very generically talking about what the properties of these measurements should have. And I'll show it this way. Imagine we can measure two different things. We can measure just how often a seven we're seeing or how often we see a one come up, whatever it might be. We choose something. What we really want is something that if one of those bad situations is true, we'll measure something. And if one of the good situations is true, we'll measure something very different. So the measurement is a good proxy for the concern. In other words, if we have a different measurement, that any value that we measure might be due to a good model or a bad model, that's not very useful to collect. So these we're going to call discriminatory measurements. We're going to talk about how to find these discriminatory measurements. And in fact, we can use that set of models that we've already built to determine whether something's likely to be discriminatory before we even measure it. And this is an important skill that we have. We can model all of those different centers of mass and say, if it's a bad, a bad model, a bad set of dice, will this thing come up differently than if it's a good set of dice? And if we do that in this case, we end up with an interesting result. And that is, if you have a chance to watch the dice roll, all you have to do is look for doubles. Doubles are what matter. So why? Why would that be? Well, I can tell you as a scientist, I can say, look, I did the math, and so believe me, but that's not very convincing, right? Because we're not explaining the outcome. So we can also take a simple approach, and we say, well, if you roll a double, it can't be a seven, so doubles are bad. See, a lot of doubles don't take the bet. But we've missed the opportunity to really help somebody to understand the actual nature of the risk that they're facing. So we go one step further. We say, what does it mean to roll a lot of doubles? It means that both dice are weighted towards the same face. That's the risk that you should have in mind. Not that I don't know where the centers of mass are, but how likely is it that the dice are weighted towards the same face? And if we really internalize that, it will move us towards betting more on the dice. All right, so as I said, we've moved a long way away from hydrogeology. We'll start to come back, and we're gonna follow this same pathway here. We're gonna describe a decision that has to be made. We're gonna then build models that deal with that decision, and then we'll look for discriminatory data along the way. The difficulty as we move into hydrogeology is that the models are much more complicated. And they're much more complicated than dice because they have a lot more moving parts. They have a lot more things that we have to define. So one way to describe those things that we define in building a hydrogeologic model is this. We might start out, many of us, by saying, I'm very comfortable with this software package or that software package. I'm going to build a mod flow model. That has a lot of other assumptions built in with it. The next thing might be, which processes do I need to include and which ones can I ignore? How do I represent those processes? And then I have to think about how I'm going to deal with all the geologic heterogeneity or complexity in the system. And then lastly, the drivers. Everything that we bring into our model. That might be climate, that might be land use, that might be the conditions on the surrounding area. Anything that we're imposing on the model, that's another set of decisions that we have to make. In general, these four types of decisions are what we call our model. But we still have another set of things that we're allowed to change. And these are called our parameters. They tell us locally, how does this medium respond to a given change, a change that's imposed upon it. And generally, the way we do model calibration is we set our model and we vary our parameters. So the model of these deep uncertainties that we have that Kahneman talks about, these understandings that we may not have about a system, and the parameters are things that we're very comfortable fiddling with to make our model fit our data. Now, that's one way to think about data and models. Another is just to give you a general description or definition of what a model is. So I like this definition, that a model is simply a specific set of choices that you make about how to represent a system. If you give me your model in readable format, I can tell you everything you know and think about the system, whether you know you think it or not, because it's built into your model. That's your representation of the system. So, we can move forward from this and then expand a bit. We say, I've told you what it looks like to build one model and have a parameter uh, field or a parameter uh, set. 
Let's also think about what it looks like to build many different models. I'm going to try to use the same construct here, which is a space, a 2D space, that contains every possible model that you could imagine to represent a given basin. So in order to do that, because we have so many dimensions of decisions that we make, I'm not only using the location of the dots, I'm using the color and their size, I could use their shape. The main takeaway is, if we're clever about it, we could map every plausible, every possible model onto a 2D surface. But now we have an uncountable number of models, many of which are terrible, right? So how do we decide which models are good and which ones are bad? Well, this is where data comes in, the other way that we use data. And essentially what we'll do is we'll say, if we imagine that this model with all of its decisions is perfectly correct, then this is what I would have measured at every place and time that I've collected data in the past. And the more this hind cast, the more closely it matches with the data I've actually collected, the more likely that model is to be useful, if not correct. So then I'm, I have this measure of model utility or model likelihood, in a sense. And I can actually combi combine these two things. I take my world of models and I extend it into a third dimension of model likelihood. And now we have the marriage of models and data in a modeling context. So the way to look at this is every model starts out on this lower space here. And then the models, the circle representing a model rises higher, the more likely it is to do a good job of predicting what you've seen in the past. And one nice thing about thinking of models and data this way is it helps you to recognize that when we collect data, we're only changing our belief in one set of models at the expense of another set of models. It's zero sum. So we're always comparing models to each other to find out which one we believe the most given new data. All right, so the last thing that I'll bring about general concepts of models. I know that many of you maybe haven't had the particular joy of building hydrogeologic models, or maybe any models, so I'll try to address that now, and I'm asking you to build a model with me. It's a simple model. All you have to do is to predict the next number in the sequence. So how are you doing so far? Pretty hard, right? It's very hard. In fact, it's impossible. Why is it impossible? Not because we don't have enough choices, because we have too many choices. We need to have some data to get ourselves started to really become creative and start proposing anything. If we see that we have a little bit more data, then we tend to follow another pattern, which is to say I can build a categorical model. I see that the number is increasing and it's a whole number. I've reduced the world a bit, but I'm only allowed to produce very simple categorical models. We do this in hydrogeology to some degree too. Then we get to another threshold where we have enough data that we feel comfortable producing and proposing a calibrated model, or a model that we say is making quantitative predictions. Now the interesting thing is when we get to this point, we have enough data to do this, we will find that we have enough data to do this in many different ways. Any one of these equations predicts two followed by four if you start with one. Any one of these mathematical models of this sequence is perfectly good right now, equally good right now. And then we reach the next way that we change how we view the world. Now we say I have a set of models that might be good, I want to collect more data, but now the role of data goes from making us more creative to making us more focused. We want the next piece of data to eliminate some of those models. And we want to continue doing that until we get to this magical point that we call a calibrated model. Now this definition, you've probably heard people use the idea of the term calibrated model before, and I would challenge you to ask them what that means, and then you can give them my definition. My definition is a calibrated model means we're out of budget. That's all it means. <laughs> or if you're a student, we're out of time, right? That's all it means. It's good enough. It basically means it's good enough. And good enough for what? Well, good enough to use it for something. Maybe we use it for more science. We use it for water management. Essentially, what we're going to use it for is to say, if this sequence, for instance, started at three instead of one, can I predict how it would progress from there? I can take my calibrated model and I can say, Trust me, this is the sequence that you're going to have. Make your decisions based on that projected sequence. And our models tend to work pretty well for a while. And then they fail, and they get things wrong. And they will always start to get things wrong at some point, right? Because we're modeling complex systems with relatively simple models. Now, if this was just an academic exercise, we can now come up with a model that answers this as well, a more complicated, more complete model. The problem comes in when somebody happened to pay you $5 million for that model, and it's going to be another five years before they have another $5 million for the next version of that model. So what do they do in that case? Well, I'd love to hear a counterexample, but what I've heard every water manager tell me so far is, I know my model's wrong, but it's the model I have, so I'm just going to use it for the next five years. 
So I think we'd probably be shocked to find how many decisions are being made using models that are known to be wrong. And that's not really a problem with models. It's a problem with the way we develop and deliver models. So this is one of the things that I want to try to put out there, is there is another way to think about the modeling process. To do this, I'm going to use an analogy. The analogy is building a model is like climbing a mountain. We're continually getting better and better as we're calibrating and refining our model. The ideal is to get to the top. Of course, that last, that final ascent is very difficult. We need technical skills. So we develop things like PEST or U-code, automated parameter estimation tools, all with the point of making sure that we are standing absolutely on the peak. We don't want anybody to come in and be able to calibrate that model any better than we can. That's our measure of skill as a modeler. And we only really have one problem, and that is that when we get there and we step foot right on the peak, usually the clouds clear and we realize that wasn't the peak after all. So we've done a really good job of finding what wasn't the actual peak, the actual real description of the system. And in fact, it's really worse than this for hydrogeology because these are friendly mountains. Our mountains look more like this. So in other words, with the data that we have and the complexity of our systems, it is very difficult to find out even where the peak is, what is the right representation of the system. So in technical parlance, this means that our models are non-unique, but there's a much more important aspect of this image, and that is any one of these three climbers might be justified in saying that they found the peak given the data that they have, but the important thing is what they call the peak depends entirely on where they started climbing the mountain. So the initial decisions that you make in your modeling process very often drive exactly where you will end up. So what's an illustration of that? Let's go back to this problem. Here we have the same system. It's going to be stressed in the same way. The only thing that's different is we have two different groups that are looking at the problem from different perspectives. So if I go and talk to the mine at the beginning of this, they'll say, well, the problem that we have is that we're only going to be able to pump or afford to pump to a certain rate. Is that even going to dewater enough or to make it worthwhile? Meantime, I go to the locals and they say, look, here's the problem. These miners are going to start pumping. Is it going to dewater our rice paddy? So very different parts of the problem are of interest to them. So what happens here? Well, essentially we can show it this way. We say we start out with lots and lots of models. Even if we just look at the very best of our models, because our mountains are flat, there are many, many good models of our system. And yet we can't afford to build all of those models. We can't build a million different models. So in the name of efficiency, we build those models that we think will answer the questions we have and we ignore the other models. So in other words, the consultant for the mine and the consultant for the locals start out in a different place in model space, and they climb the mountain, and they end up in predictably different places. This is a classic example of what Kahneman calls confirmation bias. We don't go back and revisit our initial assumptions, and we don't realize how much they influence our final decisions. Now, does this matter? I mean, is this just an a, a academic question? Well, imagine where it goes from here. We have two sets of experts who have done their best work to come up with the best models that they can, and they disagree. So now they take it to a water manager or to a judge, and they say, you decide. You decide which model to use or how to treat these models. And then along the way, as scientists, we try to tell really good stories about why our model's better. I use this kind of conjugate gradient solver, and I'd, all of these things that nobody cares about, right? And then we realize, oh, they don't care about our stories. What we need to do is hire professional storytellers. <laughs> These folks come in, and they're very good at telling stories about why you should ignore somebody else's model and use my model, right? All right. And all of this is towards the end of coming up with a model, a model that represents a system that we can use to make predictions. Well, the real problem, I think, or the larger, longer-term problem with this is if you imagine yourself being this judge or water manager, and not one time or 10 times, maybe 100 times, you find yourself in the same position of competing experts. I think you could really rationally only draw one conclusion, and that is that none of your models are worth anything. Because no matter what your model says, I can find somebody who else has another model that says something else. So I'm just going to make a decision not considering the science. This is, I think, the bigger issue that we face. So if this is a problem, if we don't want to fight it out to find the best model, what should we do? Well, one obvious example is let's do the exact opposite. Let's do what we call consensus model building. So what this is, as you can see, is you get a lot of beautiful people with perfect teeth in a room. All right, no, you get a bunch of consultants in a room, and they're going to come up with the best model just by discussion. Right? It's equally ridiculous, to be honest. There's no reason to think that just by talking about the model, you'll come up with the right model for the system. You'll have agreement, 
but you won't necessarily have the right model. Now, we think that it is still important to get people together, but not to try to get them to agree. In fact, that's the worst thing that you can do. I think what you want is for them to disagree. You want them to push different ways of looking at the system, different things to be tested about the system, different conceptualizations. And this is a guard against this confirmation bias. We start out with a more diverse model ensemble, a group of models to start with. Now, of course, the problem with this is if you tell them to disagree, they will, and they'll never come up with a model that you should use. So what it means is that we have to get used to using many models to make decisions. And how do we do that? Well, it turns out that 10 years ago, um, Eileen Potter gave her Darcy lecture on just this topic. How do we take multiple models, use them to make a better prediction in their aggregate, rather than just looking at a single model? And in the intervening 10 years, we have all become very accustomed to this idea. Again, whether we know it or not. A lot of the apps that we use are actually built on this idea of taking many different projections and often looking for the most common or the most likely projection out of those. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the tools that we use are just based on voting. They don't really know whether or not one person knows any more about navigation than another. We just look for the most common answer. Well, we can actually do better than that. In our case, remember, we have lots of different experts. In other words, lots of different models. Each one makes a different prediction. And we have some way to judge how useful each one of those models is, what their likelihood is. So essentially, we can say, I'm interested in the drawdown at this location at this time in the future. Let me predict it with every one of my models. I collect all the models that make the same prediction, and I add up their likelihoods. And in this way, I get a prediction PDF. This shows me how likely, from my set of models, how likely is each predicted value. Now, this is very insightful, very useful. First of all, the spread of that tells us something about how uncertain we are. And then secondly, and this is the way we usually use it and the way that, that really came out of Eileen's talk uh, really clearly, is that we can say that the most likely outcome, the maximum likelihood outcome, is much better prediction than the prediction of any single model that went into making that maximum likelihood collective outcome. Now, this is exactly what Nate Silver does for political polling. He looks uh, at how polls have done in the past, and he weights them more based on how well they've done in the past, and he makes projections out into the future. And I don't remember the last time he was wrong. <laughs> well, OK, maybe recently. But nonetheless, he's usually pretty right, right? In fact, even this time, he was pretty right. So, but the idea really is that we take a lot of models and we look for a single projection out into the future. That's a useful idea, but it has some real limitations. A few that I want to bring up. So here's one. We can imagine, rather than thinking about 100 models, we have two different models of a system. Each one has different parameter values, different realizations. And so there's some spread around these models. If we wanted to make an average prediction across these models, then this is what our average prediction would be. It would fall right in the middle here. Unfortunately, that lies in an area of low probability for either one of our models. And so we're already saying, well, I'm going to use a prediction that's not very likely simply because it falls amidst all of my other predictions. And I would say that if we really look at the structural uncertainties that we have in hydrogeology, we more often have a case that looks like this. We're making predictions, average predictions, that none of our models have made. And so we're making decisions based on a predicted future that we cannot predict would ever happen. So this is fundamentally a problem. It's also a real problem if we want to help people to understand their systems. And that is because once we've done this averaging, we've broken the important link between the set of decisions that describe a model and the predictions that that model makes. We can no longer do anything called knowledge discovery. I can't go back and explain why doubles matter in this case, because I've broken that connection by averaging across a lot of different models. And then specifically in terms of decision support, remember most of us, when we make a decision, we really are influenced by this part of the curve. Well, these averaging techniques do a better and better job of predicting this at the expense of this. And so if we're really looking to help people make better decisions, this averaging isn't necessarily the best way to go. All right, so what do we do about it? Well, there are plenty of folks who have done work in this. Uh, I'll tell you about what my students and I have done. We call it DIRECT because you have to have an acronym in science. And so in our case, the first part of it is discrimination inference. So we're really saying we, we want to put an effort into finding these discriminatory data that I talked about, these good proxies. And then the last part, this reduced expected cost technique. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. But it basically says that under uncertainty, different groups of people will make different decisions based on what they value. And so how can we think about what we as scientists can put forward that will be broadly useful? 
Now, this is a multi-model technique. It relies on building multiple models of a system. I already gave you a definition of a single model, but I do not want you to think of a definition of an ensemble of models as simply a bunch of individual models. I want you to think of that ensemble as an organism on, on, in and of itself, essentially. So I'm going to give you a different definition, and I want you to define that ensemble as essentially an argument among experts. So each one of these models is chosen to be a good representation of what we know, but to make importantly different predictions into the future. And the idea being that if we do that, we have not only with each model a description of a specific way of seeing the world, but as we look across all of the models, we can see all of the different ways that we've considered, and we also, by omission, see what we haven't considered. So if we want to expand or improve, we know directions that we have not yet considered. This is built on the idea that is ascribed to Lincoln in building his cabinet, where the idea that he had was to inform himself with a bunch of people who disagreed with one another. The idea being that if these people who had a predilection to disagree, if they agreed that an action was a good one to take, he felt pretty good about taking the action. More importantly, when they disagreed, the reasons that they disagreed informed him on what he had to know better, what he had to learn to make a better decision. That's the idea with our models. We want our models to help us to learn what we need to know better. So this is the idea that we have, and let's see what it looks like for a real example. So again, this was a, a contaminant problem. The, the question is, will these uh, plumes leave the site and at what time and for what kind of persistence? Uh, this was initially pitched as a standard uh, hydrogeologic consulting problem. So the idea was we're going to go out the first phase, we're going to go out and collect data, then we're going to improve our model, and then we'll do some uncertainty analysis in the parameter space on our model. So we'll give you a set of predictions, and then you can do with it what you will as the client to make decisions based on that set of predictions with uncertainty. And that's a standard way that we go forward. But as we were, go as we were starting, we thought, well, let's see if they would allow us to do something a little different. And in this case, we decided to use this direct approach. And the direct approach, what it really came to, or how, the reason we thought to use it, was that we remembered that there are three fundamental uncertainties about this system. We don't know the nature of recharge. We don't know whether that anticline dips. And we don't know anything about the boundary conditions in many cases. So how do we go about building a model and improving that model when we have these fundamental uncertainties? And this is usually the case that we have, right? We have these fundamental uncertainties and detailed uncertainties. And really, our job as modelers, or as analysts, is to try to get the right weight. How do we think about each type of uncertainty in the context of helping people to answer questions? Well, we can start at two extremes. We can say, I think that the most important thing is structural, these three fundamental uncertainties that we have. And if we do that, in the simplest case, we can build what we call a model tree, a set of related models. So rather than deciding on any one of these things, we say, I don't know if the anticline plunges or it doesn't, so I'm going to build a family of models for each realization. And then within that, I'm going to build a family of models with fast recharge and slow recharge, and one type of boundary condition and another. So in this case, we only have three uncertainties, so we end up with eight different models, related but different models. And you can see, of course, if you have 100 uncertainties, and each one can take three different values or five different values, this quickly blows up. It becomes impractical to think of every possible model but it's one extreme of dealing mostly with the structure. In contrast to this is what I would say we most often do. And that is to say, I'm a modeler. My job is to make a model. So I'm going to make what I think is the best model of the system. And then if I'm going to describe uncertainty to you, it's going to be all in the detailed uncertainty, all in the parameter values, all in these things that we're comfortable changing easily. So this is another extreme. And it obviously has some problems in that we are ignoring a huge potential source of uncertainty. Now, moving into the future, the real challenge is how do we identify out of all of these possible structural models, how do we identify a small set that represents the range of uncertainty and we do this efficiently so that we don't have an untenably large model set, but we do consider the structural uncertainty. And we'll probably wait another 10 years for a Darcy lecture to tell us how to do that. For now, of course, the point is we're trying to figure out how do we look at the concerns that somebody have, map them onto a model, and then test that model against other models. So we started out saying the dice, what you're really concerned about is whether or not you have one of these centers of mass. That's what the, the risk is. If we look at this case where we have the mine and the plumes moving, if we ask the client, the client might have many different possible outcomes. And some of those outcomes, 
will have very low utility for them. They'll be a very high risk. These are the things, these high enough probability, low enough utility, or high enough risk, these are the things that are really driving their decision making. If we get to this case where we have two different stakeholders, or even more, the only difference is that each stakeholder will have a different set of outcomes that are really important for them. So we have to consider multiple different types of models. In this case, and in every case, the real trick is this. We have to think about building models differently. It's not about getting to one peak and then the next peak. It's about how do we build a family of models that in their totality acts more like a natural system. So a natural system that's exposed to evolutionary pressure, essentially. How do we have enough models that as we gain new data, we ask new questions, we don't have to reinvent those models all the time because we already have enough diversity in our model ensemble. Now to use a term from Stephen Jay Gould, we can think of this as, as a, a punctuated equilibrium. Most of the time, we don't have to update those models. Every once in a while, we're going to get data that really changes our view of the system. That's the time that we have to repopulate our models. We have to do a large model re, uh, redevelopment. All right. So again, in our system, we only have three unknowns. That leads to eight models. We figured we could, we could afford to run 8,000 model realizations, so we used eight models, each of which had 1,000 different hydraulic conductivity distributions on the site. And the question, again, was whether or not the plume was going to leave the site. And the, we run these models, and we have to figure out how to help them to make that decision based on 8,000 different models. So the way we did it was we said the real question, the first question they have is, will the plume even cross the boundary? So let's run all 8,000 models out to 200 years and break up that ensemble. Some of them will lead to pollution. Some of them will not. So we identify all of the models that will lead to pollution, lead to mass leaving the site. And we're going to try to find something to test that set of models against the rest of the models. So to do that, we need data, but we need the right data. So we might consider we could use well A or well B. How do we decide which one to use? Often in practice, what we'll do is we'll tell stories about it. I think A is better for this reason. I think B is better for that reason. And if we can convince the other person, we win the day. But we can actually do better than that. So what we can do is, just as we did making prediction PDFs for outcomes, we can do the same for what we think we'll measure. In this case, we take all of our models with their likelihoods, and we predict how likely is each thing, each value that we would observe in well A and well B. Now, the classic way to look at this is to say, if we went to measure in well A, all of our models essentially agree with each other. And if we remember way back when I was introducing the marriage of data and models, the reason that we collect data is to change our belief in some models at the expense of others. If all of our models agree on what we're going to measure, there's no point in collecting those data. So in a general sense, we would say we should measure in well B, where we have a higher expected variance of our measurement. But of course, we're not interested in separating all of our models. We want to distinguish good outcomes from bad outcomes. We have the same distribution because we have the same model ensemble. But all we do is we now project onto those the predictions that are made by the models of concern, the ones that cause pollution. So in this case, if we look at the results, we would say even though well B has a much larger expected variance, the expected measurements for the problems of concern or the outcomes of concern are much better grouped for well A. Well A is much more discriminatory, and we have a way to actually quantify that expectation. So we can do that. We go across the whole site. We look for discriminatory measurements. In this case, we found nine additional wells that we thought should be added on the site based on their discriminatory value. Then we said, well, what we're going to do is take those 8,000 models. We'll collect these new concentration values. Any of the models that don't agree with the new data, we're just going to throw them away. So it's a simple way to do this in a cost-effective way. We end up with 4,000 models. And we still have to help people to make a decision with 4,000 models. So what we did is we looked at every location on the site, and we said, if any model says that there's going to be contamination there in 200 years, we'll color it red. So we collect up all of those red areas, and this is what we see. This is the result of 4,000 plausible models. Now, I want to take a minute here. I want to ask you to imagine that you are working, you live north of this, you live up here, and you know that I've been paid by a mining company to predict what's going to happen in the future. And I come forward and I say, well, my best model says that the plume is going to go, and then it's going to take a screaming left turn right at the boundary, and it's not going to cross. It's not very believable, right? So what are we doing instead? We say, well, here's what we've done. We've tried to consider those things that we really don't understand. 
We have 4,000 plausible models. Not one of them says the mass is going to leave the site. Now, you still not, might not be, be convinced, and you shouldn't be. It's your property, right? So what you then have to do is to say, did you consider this process? Did you make this mistake? Did you overlook this idea? And then we build a model that includes that. And if those models can calibrate, and those models will actually say that no mass leaves the site, we still don't need to make any more measurements. We haven't given any reason to think that we should. But if the new models say the mass is going to leave the site, then we have the next set of discriminatory measurements. What else would those models predict that would be different than the predictions of the other models? And let's go and measure that to try to discount those models of concern. So this is the basic idea. And this is what it looks like for a practical problem. We can do the same thing for a purely scientific problem. If we have, say, an eco-hydrologist that's interested in the temperature of water coming into a stream bed at a certain location, a certain time of year, essentially what we're saying is, how can we narrow in on those uncertainties and find what matters for that question in the context of all of these other uncertainties that we probably won't be able to nail down. So <clears throat> this, I've just shown this for the single stakeholder problem. And as I said before, for a single stakeholder, you're really looking for the one discriminatory measurement. We think one of the really nice things about this approach is when you have a problem with multiple stakeholders, really what we should be looking for are common sets of data that can answer each stakeholder's problem. So the stakeholder groups don't ever have to agree on what the preferred outcome is. They only have to agree that we're doing things that are helping all of them. And in that way, we think we can get much more buy-in. So I promised that I wouldn't give the details. The details are in this paper in Water Resources Research in uh, 2015. This is available on the, on the blog that I'll give you a link to. Um, even though it's in WRR, it's a really readable paper. It's got some very, uh, very uh, illustrative examples, I would say, as well. You can skip the math if you don't like math. All right. So where we're moving now, we're starting to look at can we do the same thing for things like geophysical data, things that are not as clearly related to a, a prediction of the, of the model. And then also, can we do this in an adaptive format? Can we do this in a way that if we do predict that the plume is going to leave the site, can we actually design pump and treat systems that are more effective given multiple realizations of the site rather than one? And that's the directions that we're going with this. We're very, very open to people who have tried something and found something that's better, or tried this very thing and found that it didn't work for them, are just interested in knowing whether or not this would actually work on a real site. That's what we, uh, what we really want to get out of it. So I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to put up this last slide. There are far too many people to acknowledge that I can put up here. These are folks that directly influenced our thinking as we were putting this talk together. Um, I also put up all the popular, popular uh, references down here. Those are most often uh, the most requested thing. Um, and then this, again, this uh, QR code will take you directly to a blog. Or if you prefer, you can, correct, you can collect or correct me uh, by email. All right. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. missed my opportunity for the 123rd talk mic drop, mic drop at the end. It's hard with the lapel, drop, lapel pin. It's hard to do that. Um, so again, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if people have them, or if folks want to come up and ask questions after. Yeah, please. Once again, third time's a charm. Thanks. Thanks very uh, much. But uh, when you're building these 4,000, 8,000 models, yeah. how are you actually practically doing that? Are you making a geologic interpretation we try to automate this as much as we can. Right now, uh, if we think about doing the parameter estimation, parameter values is relatively easy to automate. Anything that's continuous or that we can make continuous is relatively easy to automate. Um, the challenge, one of the challenges that's coming ahead is either how can we think about things that we now consider to be discrete, like a fault being there or not being there, how can we turn that into a continuous variable so that we could actually have that fault appear and disappear or be more and less continuous? Um, so we kind of look at this as a stage thing. The first thing would be you want to vary your parameter values and keep all of those plausible models and look at them. The next thing might be your boundary conditions that you can easily vary in a continuous way. And then we start moving into things like geology uh, or, or to some degree, some other boundary conditions that are usually thought of as more discrete. But all of this is in an automated fashion. So how do you deal with, uh, with the chance that there might be a fault that we don't know about? Absolutely. So we have this question of the unknown unknowns, right? And uh, 
And this is, this is a big problem, right? That there are some things that we haven't even conceived of that might turn out to be the very most important thing that's out there. So this doesn't guard against it, per se. But I think what it does is by taking the attention away from trying to find a model that we can make match our data really well and say that really our job as a modeler is to come up with as many models that are as different as each other and both match the data that we have but also make very different predictions into the future. I think it changes our mindset to say, could I imagine there being a fault there? And if that fault were there, would it be a big problem? Would I see it now? So I think it really changes the, the questions that we ask or the way we think about our job as modelers in a sense. Embrace the confusion. Embrace the confusion is a good way to say it. Exactly. Good. And yeah, please. Absolutely. And, and so this, and this is a larger question within hydrogeology, I'd say, is this balance between simple models that we can do more with, the Cliff Voss kind of approach, or very complex models that uh, purport to do everything, but you can only run them once, right? So these are the extremes, right? And what I like about this approach is it falls in the middle and it says, maybe we're going to start with a relatively simple system, but the complex models that we want to build or spend our time building are ones that we have some reason to believe they would make a difference. So we're only adding complexity in the service of th seeing whether or not it will really make a difference to the system. So in other words, in a, in a system like this, people may not come forward and say, well, did you think of biodegradation? Because it's already showing that the mass isn't leaving the site. So we don't need to add that complexity. It doesn't lead to a problem if that process is really there. So it's one way of thinking about prioritizing the complexities that we add to the system. And it also goes to this idea of how do we find that relatively small number of models that captures the important uncertainties in a system. And we have to do that essentially by using some forms of professional judgment, by saying we can project that adding this, system, adding this process may actually have an important difference. Yeah, Because I mean, your, your concern is absolutely correct. This relies on using the simplest models that we can justify using. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, please. Oh, the number. Yeah, sorry. All right, continuing it. I was wondering why everybody was looking at me with so much interest. That was a... All right, so the continue, continuing education code is 1613TF. So 1613TF. All right. Good. All right. So, yeah, please, Scott. So, what about talking about professional judgment? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So the, the idea of conceptual hydro, hydrogeologic models is a question. And um, I think for me it depends a little on the definition. So if a conceptual model means that it's only conceptual and it can't make any predictions, then at that point it's very difficult also to find data that would test it. But if a conceptual model means that you really need to spend more time thinking about your conceptual assumptions or your assumptions about the underlying concepts of the system, I think that's exactly what we're trying to promote. We're saying that, that we should spend more time, essentially one way to think of it is rather than thinking about our job as finding the best calibrated model, we should find a plausible, diverse model ensemble. And that diversity, I think, importantly comes from the conceptualization. Yeah. Good. Thank you. All right. Super. Well, if you have other questions, I'd invite you to come up. Thanks very much.